We continue in Luke 24, verses 36 to 53. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Let's talk about these, those words, these things. Picking up from the last couple weeks, remember Jesus had appeared to the Emmaus disciples, but he had caused them so that they couldn't recognize him until the very end of the day. And then the Emmaus disciples, understanding that their Lord was risen and what it meant for them, what did they do? They ran back the seven miles they had just come because they're so excited to tell these people they care about that Jesus was alive. And they get to the place where the rest of the disciples are. And it's probably more than just the 12 disciples or 11 disciples. It's probably more like a whole bunch of believers there in Jerusalem are gathered there. And they say to them, Jesus is alive. We saw him. And the people in the room say back to the Emmaus disciples, Peter says that Jesus appeared to him too. And when that happens, when those are the things that were said here, Jesus himself stood in their midst, which was very surprising for a couple reasons. Number one being, he had been dead. Number two being, the room was locked. Luke doesn't tell us that, but we learned that in other gospels. So there's a whole bunch of people. The room is locked because they're afraid. They're afraid that the leaders of the Jews are going to take them away and kill them too. And Jesus suddenly stood in their midst. And Luke and the other evangelists, they make a new attempt to tell us how Jesus was able to do this. It's the working of God. He wants to be somewhere. He is. He suddenly appears in their midst. That's what the evangelists want you to know. Regardless of how he did it, he suddenly appeared there. This was no magic trick. This was the work of God. The risen Lord appearing in their midst. And what does he say to them? And to you. Here's one of the phrases that I want you to write on your heart to take home with you today. He says to them and to you, peace to you. That's what he wants for you, peace. He's talking about an objective peace. We, for example, you know, we have peace with, uh, you know, we've had peace with Germany now for several decades. We've been at peace with Japan for a long time. Does that give you joy? You probably haven't thought about it. But on, in victory in Europe day, back in 44, and victory in Japan in 45, how did Amer Americans feel about peace on those days? It filled them with great joy. We are still objectively at peace with those countries, and yet we take that for granted. We don't worry about people bombing us from those countries. We can do the same thing with the peace that Jesus came to announce here. It wasn't peace with Germany. It wasn't peace with Japan. It was peace with God. Think back of how the people after Pearl Harbor were afraid of more places being bombed, of sudden attacks. How much more would we have to be afraid if we had to be afraid of God suddenly bombing us? Or something worse? But Jesus was there to announce to them and to us that although we deserved punishment from God, we had peace with him. We had peace with our God because Jesus took the bombing. He took the punishment and the condemnation. It was forgiven, it was gone, and he was risen to show us that. Peace to them. Objective peace. This is not something we should take for granted. But savor and joy right in our hearts so that we don't end up like the disciples. What is wrong? They're afraid, they're terrified. He says, why are you troubled? 
why do doubts arise in your, in your hearts? And as I told the kids, can't you hear the empathy here of Jesus? He knows what's going on in their hearts. He knows what's going on in your heart. Keep these words in your heart too. When you are troubled, when you are worried, when you are afraid of whatever it is, hear Jesus say to you, why are you troubled? Peace to you. I have risen from death and given you forgiveness of sins and heaven. I've given you peace with God. Joy and peace to you. He does not want you to be troubled and sad. He wants you to rejoice. And he's there to get these disciples, to give them that peace and to give it to us. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still not, did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He shows them his hands and feet. You know, um, the testimony, all the testimonies have that Jesus is risen is so compelling that over the, the centuries, many critics, many unbelievers have tried to come up with reasons to say that Jesus wasn't alive. And some of those reasons are, for example, they say, oh, the disciples were just so full of grief and despair and sadness that they imagined it. They just believe what they wanted to believe. But we find in the gospel accounts, this is not the case. First of all, the disciples were not being gullible. In fact, Jesus has to scold them for their slowness to believe. These were not people taken in. They did not just see an illusion. Jesus here is preparing the disciples to witness to the world that he himself, Jesus, was alive, the one they had known, one still with holes in his hands and in his side. This was no look-alike. This was no illusion. He eats with them. He sits with them. They knew him. They were not fooled by some imposter. This was Jesus himself, as our text said. And so they are convinced, despite all their doubts, so that they, through the work of the Holy Spirit, could go into the world and testify. And we have heard their testimony, and we know their testimony is true. Your Jesus is alive. This next phrase is very interesting. They did not believe for joy and marveled. You know, before they weren't believing because of doubts and fears. Now they're not believing for joy. What does that even mean? Well, you know, Luther here sympathizes with the disciples. He said, yes, grace is altogether too great and glorious for us to take it in. I've, I've known some pastors who've, who've talked about this. They've had people coming to them just distraught, full of guilt over the things they've done. And the pastors told them what Jesus did. Said, he died and he lives. You are forgiven. And these people said, no, that's too easy. That's too wonderful. That's too good to be true. So you can see why Luther sympathized with the disciples here. He's not saying we should do this. And Jesus isn't saying we should do this. Jesus does not want you to disbelieve that he has given you peace with God because it's too great. It is that great, and it is true. He loved you that much. So despite the things that we have all done, Jesus is giving this to you. He did die. He did rise. Yes, this seems too great and glorious to be true, but the Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart saying, it is true. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. 
This is the same thing that Jesus did for who? Just that same day he had done this for the Emmaus disciples. He started at the very beginning at Genesis and spent a several hour long Bible class opening their understanding to why this had to be. Why God himself had to become human, why he had to suffer so many things, why he had to be put to death, and why it was inevitable that he would rise from death because he was God and because it had been foretold that on the third day he would rise again. And so Jesus is doing it for these disciples too so that they might comprehend the scriptures. And this is something we should pray for. A while, a few weeks back, you know, a couple months now, I guess, we spent a lot of time working on prayer and how we can have a better prayer life. This is something we should pray for. The Lord would open our hearts to comprehend the scriptures. This is something we should add to our prayers. But you know, um, if we're praying this, which we should be, how is God going to open our hearts to comprehend the scriptures? Is it through uh, watching daytime TV? Is it through uh, going for a walk? Well, if that's walk with, with Jesus, who's doing a Bible class, then yes. All of you want to have this peace that Jesus wants to give us. We all want to comprehend how great this grace was that God poured on us, that we should be called the children of God, that we should be given, be forgiven and give eternal life. We want this. And yet, how does Jesus open their hearts and the Emmaus disciples' hearts? Through the scriptures. If we aren't spending time in the scriptures, our hearts won't be open. God is telling us how he will open your heart to take away your fear and doubt. He doesn't want you to have that. He says to you, why do these doubts enter your heart? Why is your heart troubled? He doesn't want you to have that. He will take it away when you walk with him like the Emmaus disciples and these disciples opening the Bible before you so that the Lord can open your heart. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. Do you guys know what a, a paradigm shift is? Some of you have probably heard that phrase. It's kind of nerdy, but uh, a paradigm shift is some truth that when you understand it, just changes your whole perspective of the world. Uh, one of the prime examples of a paradigm shift is people who used to think that the sun and the universe revolved around the earth. And then, oh, wait, that's not right. The earth revolves around the sun. So imagine your whole life, and you can understand how people would get this, right? You know, without telescopes and all that stuff, it looks like the sun's coming around the earth. But then suddenly, imagine that someone came in and showed you, no, no, no. We go around them. Imagine how that would blow your mind. That's a paradigm shift. Jesus blew their minds. And the Emmaus the disciples' minds. We talked about that last week. The reason the Emmaus disciples, and to a large extent, all the disciples, could understand why Jesus had died because they didn't understand how it was necessary. They didn't understand Israel and their own sinfulness. That's why they didn't understand. Now they do. He opened up their hearts to comprehend, and there's this paradigm shift. Before, because they didn't understand their need for a Savior who had to suffer such things, they were filled with doubt and worry and fear and loss of hope now that Jesus is gone. Now that he's risen and he opens their heart to understand this, now we're going to see that they're filled with confidence. They're filled with joy. So I've got to ask you, how does finding out, oh, we're such terrible sinners that we needed him to die, how does that fill them with comfort and hope? It seems a little backwards. But the truth was, the truth that caused the paradigm shift was that, that they finally understood what sinners they were, something that they mostly tried to not see. But there is a great release 
and stop hiding the truth from ourselves and a much greater and glorious release in seeing Jesus forgave all that. I no longer have to try and justify and excuse. I no longer have to use the rose-colored glasses on myself and constantly to try and make myself feel like not a terrible person. We are terrible sinners. Yet God loved us and forgave us. That led them to do this. Then so that they could go out and preach repentance or remissions of sins to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Notice this paradigm shift. So before, when Peter had confidence in himself and didn't understand his need for a savior, he's a one serving maid says, aren't you with Jesus? And what does he do? Oh, I don't know the guy. Now that he understands what a sinner and what a weak sinner he is, but that he has a savior who loved and forgave him, what is he going to do? He's going into all the world to preach this. He, according to tradition, would be crucified and said, I'm not worthy to be killed the same way as Jesus. All that because of this paradigm shift that the Holy Spirit brought about, that he finally understood why Jesus needed to die and that Jesus rose from him. We can have that same shift when the Holy Spirit opens our hearts to comprehend the scriptures so that we are courageous to preach the repentance and remission of sins. You know, we, uh, we so easily forget that. There's two parts to that, isn't there? Repentance comes first. All of you, I know I'm quite happy to tell, and I'm sure you are too, when someone comes and says, I have sinned, I'm sorry. Who of you has any problem joyfully telling them, you're forgiven? <laughs> but what needs to come before that? And sometimes the person doesn't come to us saying, I'm sorry. Sometimes they're kicking against the goads, as God said about Saul before he became Paul. They're refusing to see their sin. God said, repentance of sins needed to be preached. This is somewhere we often fail. Because this can make people angry at us. This can make us lose friends and family. When we say, you shouldn't do that. That is a sin. Our sinful nature doesn't like to say that. And yet, our Lord is risen. He died because of our sins. We can, in humility, say to that person, I am a great sinner too. I, have, I am not saying that I am better than you. I too am a sinner. But I repented and the Lord has forgiven me. This sin is not okay. Repent that you can be forgiven. And the Lord gives us the courage to say that, as he tells the disciples here. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. What is this promise? I send the promise of my Father. He was, of course, talking about the Holy Spirit that he would send on Pentecost. Now that they understood the scriptures, this Holy Spirit would be with them to give them the courage to go preach repentance and remission of sins to all the world. God gives us this promise too. He will not only open our hearts, he sends the Holy Spirit to give us the courage when we walk in his word so that we can preach those things, so that we can endure from empower on high. Uh, you know, uh, we come to verse 51 and we could kind of, we should ignore it. I mean, not always, but for today. Because 51 is talking about the ascension and we're not celebrating ascension yet. The end of Luke really doesn't cover it in very detail. Luke will again, at the beginning of Acts, cover it in more detail. So we can put a bookmark there. We're going to talk about that ascension in a few weeks. 
But we continue on to verse 50, uh, 52 and 53. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And so the book of Luke comes to an end. And we see how the disciples are changed. Jesus has parted from them, but they are filled with joy. Not because Jesus was gone forever, but because they know what Jesus had done for them and that Jesus would return. So they are filled with joy and they are blessing God. They are filled with, like what Psalm 68 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation, Zila. They understood how rich they were in their risen Lord. And you can too. You have a God who, who sees the sorrows, troubles, fears in your heart and says, why are you troubled? He empathizes. He says, peace to you. He wants you to have that peace. He tells you where you can find it. Walk with him like the Emmaus disciples and he will open your hearts to comprehend how rich you are, how great the grace of God is. It's not, it is too good to be true, and yet it's still true. He loved us that much. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. Amen. Let's continue with singing hymn 2-8, verses 1-7. to 